set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained. And it ought to be possible for American citizens of any color to register and to vote in a free election. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. This is not a video about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, at least not in the traditional sense, dissecting the minutes, seconds, and microseconds before and after the shooting itself. Instead, it's a video about the days that would follow the assassination, the reconstruction of his body, conflict with various funeral homes, and the unprecedented change that was taking place in the American funeral industry. But before we do that, we do have to acknowledge where it all started, right here behind me, at the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository Building, where Lee Harvey Oswald concealed himself and built a sniper's nest from boxes. From this window, Oswald looked down on Elm Street and waited patiently for the president's motorcade to arrive. Air Force number one, ladies and gentlemen, carrying the President of the United States. Beautiful sight, beautiful sight. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy landed at Dallas's Love Field. He was in Dallas as part of a campaign tour for his re-election to the presidency. Although re-election wouldn't be a problem if the Republicans nominated Barry Goldwater. <laughs> That's a Barry Goldwater joke. I think. I don't know that much about Barry Goldwater. Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. It was the president, along with his security detail, some close friends and aides dubbed the Irish Mafia, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson and his wife Lady Bird, the governor of Texas, John Connolly and his wife Nellie, and the president's wife, Jacqueline, or Jackie, Bouvier Kennedy. They were all part of a motorcade that would take them through the streets of Dallas. The route had been published the day before, and people were lining the streets. Although not all were Kennedy fans, mind you. There were those who thought Kennedy was a communist, a traitor. A sign read, Yankee go home, courtesy of the Dallas Indignant White Citizens Council. <laughs> But they decided to move forward with the appearance, and President Kennedy and Jackie greeted the public at Love Field. At around 11.45 a.m., they boarded a convertible limousine, along with the governor and Nellie Connolly, that would take them to downtown Dallas. At 12.30 p.m., the motorcade was on Houston Street and made a hairpin turn onto Elm Street at Dealey Plaza. That turn took the president's open limousine directly in front of the Texas School Book Depository. People crowded the streets and nearby grassy knoll, waving and straining for a glimpse of the handsome young president and his beautiful wife, who was perfectly outfitted in an iconic pink Chanel suit and pillbox hat. At that moment, shots rang out. Two bullets hit President Kennedy, the first in the throat, which passed through Kennedy and also hit Governor Connolly, and the second in the back of his head. Chaos ensued. Was it a car backfiring? What was that? The car that held President Kennedy, Jackie, and the governor filled with blood. The president's limousine sped to Parkland Memorial Hospital, four miles away, arriving at 12.36 p.m. Parkland had not been properly notified. Stretchers were not waiting for the president. Attendants were not there. When Kennedy arrived at Parkland, he was still, shockingly, if only technically, alive. His eyes were fixed and dilated, but his heart continued to beat and his lungs fought to breathe. Though doctors knew that the president was most certainly going to die, they continued to administer life-saving measures. But we know how this part ends. We know that the president would die. This is really where Jackie Kennedy, covered in blood but still very much alive, becomes the main character of our story. 
Jackie would not leave her husband's side, exhibiting an obstinate protectiveness that would continue over the days to follow. She had cradled him as they tried to take him from the car, saying, you know he's dead, let me alone. She wouldn't even leave him as he was being raced into the trauma room. Jackie ran beside him, her hand on the stretcher. As doctors worked desperately, Jackie made a decision. I'm going in there, she said. Nurse Doris Nelson, determined to uphold hospital policy, stood in her way, but Jackie would not be stopped. I'm going to get into that room, she informed Nelson. Dr. George Berkeley, Kennedy's loyal personal physician, came to Jackie's side and offered a sedative, which she refused, telling the doctor, I want to be in there when he dies. Berkeley turned to Nurse Nelson and said, it's her right, it's her right, it's her prerogative, and led Jackie into the trauma room. The trauma room somehow had even more blood, tissues, tubes, and machines connected to Kennedy, medical personnel running around trying in vain to save the dead president. Chief neurosurgeon William Kemp Clark said to Jackie, your husband has sustained a fatal wound. And she mouthed the words, I know. At 1 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas, Texas, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was declared dead. A Catholic priest, Father Oscar Huber, made his way through the throng and administered the last rites to the 35th President of the United States. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Jackie retreated to a folding chair outside the trauma room, sitting silently, politely thanking people for their condolences. Lee Harvey Oswald, a book depository worker who had also shot and killed a Dallas police officer in the chaos after the assassination, would emerge as a prime suspect. But Kennedy's people believed there may be others who were coming after the president and those close to him, and urged everyone back to Washington. I'm not going to leave here without Jack. Jackie said. So the most important order of business became getting the president's remains out of Dallas. In order to do this, they needed a casket. Vernon O'Neill of O'Neill Funeral Home, located two and a half miles away, got a confidential call from the Secret Service. This is Clint Hill of the Secret Service. I want you to bring a casket out here to Parkland. I want you immediately. O'Neill responded, hold on. Hold on, we've got merchandise at all prices. Bring the best one you have. Any questions? O'Neill selected the Elgin Casket Company's Handley Britannia casket, his most expensive. It was over 400 pounds of double-walled, hermetically sealed, solid bronze, which, perhaps a spoiler here, is absolutely the worst choice for swift and easy cross-country transport of one of the most important dead bodies of all time. But O'Neill had his orders from the federal government, the best one he had. So he, along with three others from his staff, hurriedly loaded the casket into his brand new 1964 white Cadillac hearse and sped to Parkland with an ambulance sign in the window. Jackie went to her husband's side and took off her wedding band. At her father's funeral, she had placed an item he had given her into his casket. Now she picked up Jack's hand and with the help of an orderly, she put the ring on his finger. She turned to Ken O'Donnell, a devoted advisor of Kennedy's, and asked, the ring, did I do the right thing? His response was, you leave it right where it is. When O'Neill arrived with the casket, people leapt up to shield and distract Jackie from the sight of it. But again, she resisted. When Dr. Clark, the neurosurgeon, told her she couldn't go into the room as they casketed her husband, she said, do you think seeing a coffin can upset me, doctor? I've seen my husband die, shot in my arms. His blood is all over me. How can I see anything worse than I've seen? O'Neill, the funeral director, I imagine was probably absolutely crapping his pants. I don't care how much of a funeral professional you are, you were just eating donuts in the break room and 20 minutes later you're smack in the middle of an event of world historic proportions. What's more, it was becoming apparent that the president could not be placed directly into the casket. 
Kennedy's wounds were so severe that both O'Neill and Kennedy's people were afraid that the president's remains would leak fluid all over the inside of the satin-lined casket as it was transported. Opening the casket on the East Coast to reveal such carnage would be unacceptable. So over the next 20 minutes, staff lay plastic inside every inch of the casket with layers of rubber bags around Kennedy's massive head wound. The casket was closed and Jackie Kennedy was eager to get to Love Field. But a new problem had arisen. Dr. Earl Rose, the Dallas County Medical Examiner. Dr. Rose was all law and all procedure, and in his mind, there had been a homicide on his turf, and Kennedy's body was his to autopsy. These federal government people were flouting Texas statutes and ignoring his duties as medical examiner. When Special Agent Kellerman stopped him from entering trauma room one, telling him, this is the body of the President of the United States, and we are going to take it back to Washington. Rose literally wagged his finger at them and said, when there's a homicide, we must have an autopsy. The thing is, Dr. Rose was right. No one else gets to be shot in Dallas and then whisked away on a plane with no medical and legal investigation. And in 1963, there was no overriding federal law concerning the assassination of a president. There was only state law, and as far as Rose was concerned, he was state law. But this thought horrified Jackie and Kennedy's people, and they refused to allow Dr. Rose access to the president. An autopsy would most definitely be performed in Washington, they told him and even said that Rose could come along on the plane as the president was transported, but Rose refused. It had to be Dallas County. A death certificate must be filed before the body could be transported, and he was there to uphold that law. A justice of the peace, who Kennedy's people were sure would give them permission to leave with the body, instead told them, it's just another homicide case as far as I'm concerned. Permission or no permission, they were going. With dozens assembled in the hospital halls, Special Agent Kellerman began wheeling the casket out of the hospital. Jackie followed behind, resting her hand on it protectively. Dr. Rose stood at the door, backed by Dallas police officers ready to draw their weapons, intent on stopping them. It was a literal standoff over President Kennedy's remains. Secret Service and the Irish Mafia were prepared to physically restrain Dr. Rose, or even come to blows. But Rose stood down, and all the president's men managed to push and pull the casket out of the hospital to O'Neill's waiting hearse. One of the judges on the scene, Judge Theron Ward, hastily drew up a kind of ad hoc burial transit permit, and the neurosurgeon signed a blank death certificate. It wasn't the correct paperwork, but it would get Kennedy out of Dallas. Years later, Dr. Rose's son would say it wasn't fair how Rose was depicted as an unreasonable, petty state bureaucrat with a gripe. And an argument can and has been made that the ensuing conspiracy theories about the assassination might have been less extreme if Rose had been able to keep a tight chain of evidence and autopsy Kennedy as soon as possible, as he did when autopsying both J.D. Tippett, the officer shot by Lee Harvey Oswald just 45 minutes after Kennedy, and autopsying Oswald himself two days later. At 2.08 p.m., the door to the hearse was closed, and President Kennedy was finally on the way to Love Field. Funeral director Vernon O'Neill had also thought he would be acting as loyal funeral director at his funeral home or in Washington. In fact, not only would he not be going with Kennedy, he wouldn't even be going with his own hearse. Kennedy's people drove off without him, and O'Neill was told he could pick up his vehicle at the airport later. He wondered, out loud, how he'd be paid for all this. The time for that question, Vernon. Just, just give him the hearse. You get to write "loving home of final care for President Kennedy" on your brochures for the rest of your life. Funeral directors love that stuff. The hearse arrived at Gate 28 at Love Field, the airport where just a few hours earlier President Kennedy had arrived to jubilant crowds. Do you all remember the casket, the one that's 
over 400 pounds of double-walled, hermetically sealed solid bronze? Kennedy's men insisted on taking the casket out of the hearse and loading it onto Air Force One themselves, via the narrow stairs at the tail of the plane, where seats had been removed to accommodate the president. A 400-pound casket, now with a 180-pound body of an adult male in it, and none of Kennedy's people had ever transported a casket. First, they didn't understand that they couldn't just pull the casket out of the hearse. The casket was locked into the floor of the vehicle, a measure that stopped it from jostling around while on the move. To be fair, they could have just brought O'Neill along for this part to be like, guys, guys, it's a, li it's a little switch right there. But with emotions running high and a near frantic desire to get out of Dallas, Kennedy's men used their might to yank the casket free. The biographer Manchester describes two brittle cracks as the men pulled on the casket. Finally, it broke free, but not before cracking one of the hinges and leaving one of the handles at the head of the casket nearly broken off. Undaunted, Kennedy's people managed to load the casket into the tail portion of Air Force One at 2.20 p.m. The mood on the plane was distant, sorrow-filled, awkward, all the things you would imagine. Everyone was navigating the shock alongside this liminal space between the former and future president. Kennedy's people insisted they take off immediately, but Vice President Johnson and his staff maintained they had to stay for him to be sworn in as president before leaving. At 2.28 p.m., Judge Sarah T. Hughes arrived and climbed aboard the plane. Kennedy's people, who were very quickly learning they no longer held any authority, tried to protect Jackie from Johnson's request that she be present for the occasion. But she appeared, and quietly, with head bowed, took her place next to him. In the iconic photo, the bloodstains are not visible, but Jackie is central, head tipped toward the judge, her eyes fixed, a portrait of grace, grief, and pain. The flight to Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland was somber. Jackie sat by Kennedy's casket, with Kennedy's people cramming themselves into the tail of the plane to be close by. People came over to offer Jackie condolences, and she met them with a level of compassion that many would remember with awe. In particular, she insisted that an ambulance drive Kennedy's remains to Bethesda Naval Hospital rather than a hearse, and more importantly, she asked Agent William Gear to drive. Gear had been the one driving the car when President Kennedy was shot. He was overwhelmed by guilt over having not swerved or found a way to save the president. Jackie's trusting him to drive President Kennedy one more time touched the man's soul. By 6 p.m. local time, Air Force One arrived at Andrews. Upon arriving, Robert Kennedy, JFK's younger brother and attorney general, bounded onto the plane, ignoring Lyndon B. Johnson, a point that the new president remained silent on, but noticed he went straight to Jackie and said, hi, Jackie, I'm here. It was astonishing how much like his brother John he was in that moment. But something was still to go very Wrong. I'll save you the suspense. It's the casket. It's the casket again. The lift that was sent to Air Force One to lower Kennedy's casket down to the tarmac was too short. Kennedy's people, and Jackie had asked that they handle the casket instead of the military, had to carefully manhandle the casket onto the platform so it could be lowered. At this point, it was abundantly clear that the casket was damaged, and all this jostling would break it further. The casket was finagled onto the platform and lowered, only to find out that it stopped five feet from the ground. Now the military did have to step in to help Kennedy's men lower the heavy, broken casket to the ground. The whole situation was clumsy and embarrassing. A reporter called it grotesque. When the president's casket was finally off the lift, it was loaded into an ambulance. Jackie scurried into the back of the ambulance to be with Jack, and Robert Kennedy climbed up front. In the 40 minutes it took to get to the hospital after landing, Jackie said to Special Agent Kellerman and Robert Kennedy, I don't want any undertakers. I want everything done by the Navy. 
Jackie didn't want any undertakers. If you remember, Vernon O'Neill had believed that he would be caring for Kennedy's remains in Dallas until he was abruptly informed otherwise. There are funeral directors who will watch this and absolutely cringe at all the places things would have gone better and been smoothed over if they had only put trust in a funeral director. And this is one of those cases I think I agree. There is a certain type of funeral director who is equipped to create the absolute pageantry and flawless execution that is expected of a presidential funeral. I, for one, admit I would be completely unqualified. I'd be like Vernon O'Neill in there like, oh my god, why am I casketing a president who was assassinated like an hour before? Oh look, they stole my hearse. What is going on? But here is a crucial piece of information. Jackie Kennedy and Robert Kennedy did not want a funeral director involved at any point in Kennedy's death care and funeral. This was 1963, after all, and they knew their Mitford. A few months before Kennedy's assassination in 1963, Jessica Mitford's The American Way of Death was published to huge fanfare. It was a runaway New York Times bestseller, taking aim at the funeral industry, calling it a huge, macabre, and expensive practical joke on the American public. Now these are lead-coated steel, medium price range. Mitford argued that the funeral industry in America sanitized death, while at the same time codifying its most gruesome practices, including the lavish casket, embalming, makeup, mourning memorabilia, and burial vault. The Silent Night Special. And very special it is too, if I may say so. Her descriptions of the embalming process were so graphic that her first publisher broke their contract with her. When The American Way of Death was published, the average funeral came to the exorbitant cost of between $700 and $1,000. To put this in perspective, the median annual income was only $5,600. Mitford's righteous indignation at the high funeral costs and lavish funerary products tapped into the zeitgeist of the time. Americans felt deeply taken advantage of by the funeral industry, and we're ready for a scathing takedown. This offers maximum protection for a unit in the middle price range. As an alternative, Mitford argued for the simplest funeral possible with the simplest casket possible, followed by a cremation. There was no need for the dead person to be sprayed, sliced, pierced, pickled, trussed, trimmed, creamed, waxed, painted, rouged, and neatly dressed, transformed from a common corpse into a beautiful memory picture. Not merely waterproof, nor moisture-proof, Mr. Barlow, but dampness-proof. The funeral industry, as you can imagine, could not have hated this woman more. Not only was she British, she was a former communist, the red sheep of her aristocratic English family. To this day, funeral directors are angry about Mitford, and they can really hold a grudge. You're just gonna need to trust me on that one. This is one part of what makes 1963 one of the most fascinating years in American death. Alongside the publication of The American Way of Death and the Kennedy assassination, there was the Pope stepping into the cremation debate and lifting the ban on cremation for Catholics. Catholics like the Kennedy family. When Mitford's book was published, only about 3% of Americans were cremated. 3%. Now, acceptance of bodily dispositions moves extremely slowly, but numbers began to rise with The American Way of Death's publication, growing to almost 60% of Americans now. I would argue a lot of those percentage points are as a result of the theoretical groundwork laid by Jessica Mitford and those who agreed with her. Which is not to say the legacy is not complicated. My colleague Dr. Cammie Fletcher argues convincingly that Mitford was so worried about the cost of funerals that she wouldn't allow her argument to be complicated by race, ethnicity, immigration, or even gender. And while I agree with Mitford's overall critique of the funeral industrial complex and the financial pressures on the family, I can give you our eternal flame and either perpetual eternal or standard eternal. I devoted a whole chapter in my first book to why telling families to cut out all ceremony and get the least expensive cremation you can find is not always the answer. It's the realistic interaction with death and rituals around the dead body that people were being cheated out of by the funeral industry. 
not just money. But most important for our purposes is that by the time of Kennedy's assassination, Mitford's book had infiltrated the Kennedy circle. Robert, his brother, had read it, as had Jack and Jackie's close friend, William Walton, his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, and possibly, but not proven, even Jack and Jackie themselves. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to Jackie, the involvement of a funeral home had already been discussed in Washington earlier that day. Not only did they need a new casket, and boy howdy did they need a new casket, but despite Robert and Jackie's wishes that the military hospital and only the hospital handle the president's remains, it was not possible. While the hospital could do the embalming, quote, the military isn't equipped to prepare the remains. That is, they weren't restorative embalmers. They couldn't do the work to make Kennedy look like Kennedy again. He needed major reconstruction, and for that, he had to go to a specialized funeral home. Enter Joseph Goller's Sons, a prestige funeral home that had been handling high-profile state deaths in Washington, D.C. since 1850. Goller's had handled the remains of President Taft and President Franklin Roosevelt. Their viewing hours were even a tourist attraction in D.C. But first, they had to perform the autopsy. After accidentally leaving Kennedy in his casket behind with his makeshift pallbearers for five minutes outside Bethesda, the error was realized and Kennedy's casket was brought to the morgue. Only, once they were there, they realized that the stairway leading to the morgue doors was too narrow for the casket to fit. There was more manhandling and more banging up of the already broken casket. Could we just put him on a gurney or something? We just, we can't do this anymore. It's simultaneously the best argument for having funeral directors to handle the body and the best argument against funeral directors, since they're the reason this monstrosity of an overpriced hermetically sealed casket even existed in the first place. All our units are waterproof. When the casket finally made it into the morgue, the Handley Britannia casket was opened. And no, the plastic and rubber had not protected the interior of the casket from the carnage. Kennedy's remains were moved to an autopsy table by the Navy team that would perform the autopsy. Kennedy lay naked on the table. Aside from his head wound, he was remarkably unblemished. For hours, doctors performed an autopsy of the president, taking photos, extracting bullet fragments, examining the body for entry and exit wounds. A fragment of the president's skull had been found on Elm Street and had been sent to Bethesda. Said Lieutenant Richard Lipsy, who was present for the autopsy, there was no question in their minds that the bullets all came from the same direction. What if this suddenly became a second shooter on the Grassy Knoll video? It's not going to, but would that be a twist? And conspiracy people in the audience, and I know there are conspiracy people in the audience, I just want to talk about rising cremation rates through American history, don't come for me. Was the CIA involved? Was Russia involved? I, I, uh, who knows? You know who was involved? Jessica Mitford. By midnight, the autopsy was finally finished. All during this time, Jackie, Robert, and Kennedy's people had been discussing the funeral, as well as who would handle the cosmetic reconstruction of the president, should there be a viewing, which was absolutely in question. Jackie remained in her stained suit, still exhibiting enormous compassion to those who had loved her husband. Though the autopsy was finished, the president still needed a new casket, so Ken O'Donnell and Larry O'Brien, another Kennedy advisor and Irish mafia member, went to Gawler's to get a casket. There's some confusion as to what happened at Gawler's. In the spirit of Mitford, O'Brien requested the plainest one you have in the middle price range and he was shown choices by Gawlers. Robert Kennedy thought he spoke to Gawlers about a moderately priced $1,400 casket, a point Gawlers does not recall. But a $2,000 casket was selected, and with it, the most expensive vault in the establishment. The total came to $3,160, which was not what Robert had asked for. Gawlers brought the casket to Bethesda, where their embalming and reconstruction team, supervised by Joe Gawler's chief assistant, Joe Hagan, went to work, attempting to fill and rebuild the president's missing skull and exposed brain with cotton and plaster. 
They worried the whole time about potential leakage from the skull, a very relatable funeral director concern. They worked until approximately 4 a.m. to set his face, return his pallor, and try to bring him back to the Jack Kennedy his wife and brother mourned. Journalist Jim Bishop reported that the morticians were, in a manner of speaking, magicians. Oh, he's beautiful. They repaired the president's shattered skull layer by layer, quote, whispering incantations to each other until Kennedy was whole again. They dressed him, put a rosary in his hands, and placed him into the new casket made of gleaming African mahogany. As this was happening, tensions continued to rise around the question of the viewing. Jackie did not want an open casket, but Robert Kennedy and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara believed that a president belonged to the people and his casket must be open. I want the coffin closed so badly you can't have it open, Jackie insisted to McNamara in the kitchen at Bethesda. It can't be done, Jackie. Everybody wants to see the head of state. I don't care, she said. And she said of his embalmed body, it's the most awful, morbid thing. They have to remember Jack alive. Said McNamara later, the tension in that kitchen was unimaginable. In the small hours of the morning, President Kennedy returned home to the White House the path to the north portico lit by small flames. The light in the east room glowed. Military pallbearers carried the president's casket to the east room and placed it upon a catafalque. A priest said a prayer, as did Jackie. She then turned and went upstairs, leaving Robert to keep his promise to her that he'd settle the question of an open or closed casket. Robert asked the military death watch, a group of men who would stay vigilant at the dead president's side, to leave, and approached his brother's casket, the lid already opened for him. He looked down at his brother for the first time and realized there was no way his brother could be seen by the public this way. He exited the East Room and asked some other close friends to go look at the embalmed and reconstructed body letting them know Jackie wants it covered. They would echo both him and Jackie, saying things like, it's appalling, it's too waxen, too made up. The Kennedy's dear friend, William Walton said, you mustn't keep it open. It has no resemblance to the president. It's a wax dummy. It, he said, not him. Robert agreed and said, close it. And so it was. At Jackie's request, the casket was opened one final time on Sunday, before President Kennedy went to the Capitol Rotunda to lie in state. Jackie wanted Robert and her to have some last moments of privacy with Jack. She asked Special Agent Hill to get her some scissors, and she cut a lock of Jack's hair. As of 12.46 p.m. on Sunday, November 24, 1963, President Kennedy's casket would never open again. Seeing him again, she was pleased with the decision to leave the casket closed. It isn't Jack, she thought. It isn't Jack. A quarter of a million people came to pay their final respects to President Kennedy. The casket remained shut. While Jackie and Robert did not fully get their wish that a funeral home would not be involved, they kept a tight grip on what this state funeral would be. No five-foot-tall cross and silver candlesticks that Gawlers brought in, only flowers and simplicity. Well, simplicity for a state funeral of a sitting president, anyway. And this is really the question. How much did Kennedy belong to the people, and how much did he belong to Jackie and his family? Even I am torn on this. In many ways, I think Jackie did an elegant job of the balance. There is no doubt that Jackie indulged in public presidential pageantry for the benefit of a country in mourning. The same caisson that carried Lincoln also carried Kennedy to St. Matthew's Cathedral for the funeral mass, and then to Arlington National Cemetery. The cemetery Jackie chose as opposed to a Catholic cemetery, precisely because Jackie did believe he belonged to the nation. She chose to walk behind the caisson, 
Jackie remained in control for this funeral, from the music to asking her son John to salute his father's casket, which appears in this well-known photograph. At President Kennedy's grave, she was behind the placement of the eternal flame. But when it came to the body of JFK, Jackie didn't want that kind of funeral for her husband. She wanted something real and raw and connected. She had already sat for a full day covered in her husband's blood. She wasn't interested in turning that visceral grief and destruction into pageantry and the reconstructed waxen image of his face. Something that is often forgotten is that just three months before Kennedy was assassinated, Jackie Kennedy had given birth to her son, Patrick. Patrick lived just two days before dying of infant respiratory distress. Jackie would still have been in deep grief for her son when her husband was also taken from her. Maybe she no longer felt it was her job to do everything for the public, and her trauma required something different. What Jackie seemed to want was just access to her husband's body, as it truly was, chaotic though it was. Time for rituals, like giving him her ring, and cutting locks of hair, and dropping in letters from their children. She obviously was uncomfortable with funeral directors, but to be fair, she didn't want anyone around her husband other than their close family and friends. When Jackie herself died, more than 30 years later, in 1994, you saw these same tensions reflected. She made choices for privacy and intimacy. Her body was embalmed in her own bathroom and waked right in her living room. Yet she also understood her public duty and would be buried in Arlington Cemetery next to her husband in the same model of mahogany casket as John. Her son Patrick is buried there as well. And as you are probably wondering, you may not be wondering, what happened to O'Neill's original casket? Two months after President Kennedy was buried, Vernon O'Neill requested the federal government pay him $3,995 for the casket. That's the equivalent of $37,000 in today's money. When the government balked, he dropped the price to $3,495. This public attempt to run collections on Jackie Kennedy caused a large drop-off in his business. O'Neill really would have preferred the original casket back instead, given that he had gotten offers of $100,000 for the casket from collectors. The Kennedy family insisted the government just pay for the casket and O'Neill's services, a final settlement of $3,160, and the casket was taken into the government's possession. In late 1965, a bill was passed to preserve anything associated with Kennedy's assassination. But because the casket was discarded and considered surplus, except to those, quote, morbidly curious, it was decided it should be destroyed. On February 18, 1966, the casket was flown 100 miles east of Washington to a spot in John F. Kennedy's beloved Atlantic Ocean. At 10 a.m., the casket, drilled with holes and weighted with sandbags, was pushed into the ocean from an aircraft, where it quickly sank. Apparently, Kennedy had spoken about a desire to be buried at sea. And as if evidence of how much the funeral industry had changed since the Kennedy assassination and Jessica Mitford, in 1999, after John F. Kennedy Jr.'s tragic death in a plane crash, his recovered remains were cremated taken out to the Atlantic, some hundred or so miles from his father's first doomed casket, and committed to the sea. Thank you, as always, to our patrons, who give us the space for this level of research, and the opportunity to travel and film in places like Dallas and the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, which appears in this video.